We keep talking about risk and uh, risk assessment and safety, and tonight we're going to discuss another way to do just that. Okay, so this task is on page 111 of your task guide. And again, unfortunately, changes have been made since this was written. Uh, primarily, uh, we used to use a Department of Defense form, uh, 2977, and that's what it talks about in the, in the guide. Uh, so all the pictures in the task guide would refer to that form. However, we have introduced our own form recently. And so if you take a look in the whoops, go back here, go here. If you look in the chat, uh, I have given you the link to uh, form 160. So that's what we will be using this evening and uh, in our and for our format. So uh, it's it was actually produced in May of 2020. So obviously this was all written. Uh, a long, uh, while back before then too. Um, so you can find it now at that address that I've listed on the screen and I've also put that in the chat. Um, and of course you can always Google the form and get the link that way as well or go to gocivilairpatrol.com and search the forms. So you got several ways to get to it. Uh, the form looks a bit different but the essential information it contains remains the same. So before we take a look at it, However, we need to understand why we use it. So the Form 160 helps us through the risk management review, the five-step process loop that we continuously use to identify potential failure points in UAS flight operations, assign a level of risk to them, create actions or controls that will reduce that risk, and finish up by identifying who's responsible and what they need to do. I'm sure that all of you safety officers out there are familiar with this picture. So at the conclusion of the use of the worksheet, the UAS mission pilot will have created a plan to mitigate risks to an acceptable level in order to get approval from higher authority. You may have already done this in your brain, but this form allows you to have something concrete to refer back to later. So this form actually will complement the ORM matrix because the ORM matrix identifies overall levels of risk associated with an activity. The, what we call the DRA or the Deliberate Risk Assessment Worksheet, um, where it takes the initial level of risk <clears throat> as a starting point and identifies mitigation that can further reduce risk to an acceptable level. So it is deliberate because it takes risk analysis one step further to risk mitigation. So you can always refer to it when asked about an emergency planning by your flight release officer. And now, a little bit of honesty on my part. I don't fill one of these out every single time we fly, and I'm not gonna ask you to do it. This is what I've done. I've created an initial document that I refer to as a living document. As I've done it, I make, uh, I place more sub activities as I encounter them. I then reprint and replace it in my ever popular binder. Everybody knows my Bible binder. So any possible risk that I have encountered or feel I will potentially encounter is listed on that form. We're going to discuss two risks this evening. Um, and, and again, we're, then we're going to go into a couple of others uh, as an exercise I've identified 28 specific risks so far. And as I said, every time I update it, I just put the new date. If anybody needs to see it, I show it to them. There it is. You may not see all 28 risks. You may not need all 28 risks where you are. So it's all going to be up to you because you are the person that is doing that risk assessment. Does that make sense with everybody? Yep. Okay, so now that we know why we're using it, let's take a look at what it is. So the first section of the worksheet contains identifying and contact information and the signature of the preparer. For what, for what I've done, the activity is SUAS flights. The date I use is the date that I last updated it. My name, my rank, my unit, the email, my telephone number, all pretty self-explanatory stuff. And for duty title position, 
I put PIC, pilot in charge. I'll tell you that there is an error in the form so that you aren't fighting with it for hours though. There is an error when you are trying to fill out the electronic form. Just hand print your phone number. Trust me. Otherwise, you will be fighting with that form forever because it keeps giving you an error. You try putting in the area code and it says it's not the proper format. You do it without the area code, it says it's not the proper format. Try it with dashes, it's not the proper. Just <laughs> trust me, just print it. <laughs> print your error number. Just trust me. Okay, so when it filled out, it looks something like this. Okay, so my activity, SUAS flights. The last time I updated it was the 26th of January when I was out in Florida. I, re I recognized a, a risk, so I put it in. Um, prepared by, put my name. At the time, I was only a first lieutenant, I, so I should actually redo that. Um, uh, PIC, whoops. PIC is my, as my duty with my unit number, my email address. I've handwritten my phone number and, of course, my signature. So before we start filling out the next section, we need to take a look on page three of the form where we find the following chart. We need to use this for every entry that we make. The matrix goes from extremely high to, to low risk, depending on the frequency and the severity of the potential event. So the frequency or probability of encountering the event is on the top and is labeled A through E. So we have, if it's very frequent, chances are, it, and depending on where we, we fall here and when we talk about the severity, it, it's going to be medium to extremely high. If it's unlikely, it's going to fall in the medium to low. Okay. The severity, as I said, is, is here. And the potential event is found on the right, and it's numbered one through four in Roman numerals. So we have catastrophic, critical, moderate, negligible. So to look for a frequency of, or probability of occasionality when we encounter the risk, and we're going to look at the severity of moderate injury, we would find click we would find D at the top and three on the, on the side, and we would find that the risk assessment is low. So if we have a frequency of seldom or infrequent occurrence with a moderate risk, it, we can actually put in low on the worksheet. Okay. So, and there's the low, L equals low risk. So it's important to note that the red warning, note all residual risks identified as H or EH must be approved by CAP CC. Okay, anyone know who that is? Sorry, Colonel Bomber. Nope, think higher. Region. National Queen Commander. Commander. National Commander. Hmm. Cap CC. So that the only if it's EH or H, only National has the authority to give us permission. <clears throat> and that's in accordance with Regulation 160-1, which we've already discussed. I'll be honest, it's very rare that we get an EH or H. Uh, I think I have two mediums and everything else is low in mine. So. so now we're ready to fill out the next part of the form. So we have six columns that we'll be using. We have the subactivity. So the activity is SUAS flying. We have a subactivity. We have the possible hazard, the initial risk level, the risk control that we are going to, to use, how we're going to implement that control, and who will implement it? Settle down. I have a very particular kitty cat tonight. And the residual risk level. So after we've implemented it, 
what then happens? Did, did we modify the risk? If it was already low, then obviously we don't modify the risk. If it was medium, there's a potential that we've now brought it to a low. So the page gives us three boxes to start, but we know we're more likely to meet, to, we're gonna need more. So National has already thought of that. Additional spaces for items four through nine provided on page two. Page two has room for 10 more entries and can be printed as many times as we need to. It can also, it can also be reprint, like it can be reprinted as well as uh, replenished in, your, in, in uh, if you've got an, a, an Adobe that you can actually use, you can actually copy it so that now you have several page twos. Uh, I'm lucky that's what I've done. Um, so let's use the example in the task guide, but put it on our new proper form. So the first category of potential hazard identified in, th in this deliberate risk assessment is takeoff and landing mishaps. Okay, within this category, there are two hazards that we've identified, operator error and automatic takeoff and systems error. In column six is an initial risk as shown based on the risk assessment matrix. In column seven, we have the risk assessment, uh, sorry, the controls, uh, sorry, the risk controls that we would use that could mitigate the hazards, okay? And then in column nine, or in column eight, the ant, uh, answers the question as to who will be mitigating and how, who will be implementing it and how will, be, how will the mitigation follow with the how and the who. Okay, and then the final column shows us. So if we take takeoff and landings and we go to operator error, the initial risk is low. How can we control that risk? By training, duty day limits. Does anybody not know what that means? Everybody knows what duty day limits are? Yes. Hours. Exactly. Okay, pilot pairing, which again goes in line with duty day limits and the sortie, the sortie ORM. So how are we gonna implement it? We're gonna implement procedures and we're, and we're going to have, uh, we're gonna have standard operating procedures and standard uh, uh, clarifying procedures and assess the ORM before the flights. And it's gonna be the pick that's gonna do that. When we have the operator takeoff and landing system failure, what are the initial risks? low. We practice pilot change of command procedures and we, we, uh, we have pre-flight inspections. Then we have the PIC and UAST who will execute pre-sortie and pre-flight checklists. So within this category, as I said, we've got the two hazards identified and we've taken a look at them. So operator error, automatic takeoff and landing system errors, they're both low. In column seven, the controls are listed, which could mitigate the hazards. So for operator error, we have determined four potential controls. Okay. So that's basically what we're looking at. Sorry, oh, what's going on? There we go. So then in column eight, we, fall, uh, we follow the, we implement how and who, and then we have a residual risk level. I know I'm sounding repetitive, but I wanna go through it to make sure that everybody uh, does this properly for themselves. This is something that we can discuss it's not something that I can do for you. Only you can do this because everybody's going to have different um, situations that they need to assess for, okay? A per, another example of, of this, now obviously this is very, this is really, really out there, but someone who is in Maine dealing with a lot of 
um, uh, 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 of sea and and and, and uh, seashore type of environments is going to have a very different assessment uh, of risk than someone who's flying in Colorado in the mountains. Make sense? And again, as I said, we do the same. For, uh, every time we do it, we do the same thing. So, the task guide then continues with several other examples of subtasks, okay? Uh, but you get the idea. We're not gonna go into each and every one of them by putting them on the form, mainly because the one thing you'll find is that you're gonna come up with your own subactivities and your hazards that aren't mentioned here. Like I said, make your form a living document and you'll always be prepared to keep it up to date and show that you are thinking risk management at all times. But for the purposes of the task, someone give me another subactivity. What other subactivity could you think of? Birds. Birds. So flying in itself. Right. So when we take we take a look at at at, uh, at a at a situation with birds. So the subactivity is flying. The hazard, birds. The initial risk level. What's the initial risk level of birds of, of birds with the with the with the SUAS? If we go back, to, if we go back, let's go back to our. Do, do, do. There we go. Let's go back to our, ta our, our risk assessment matrix. Negligible. Um, yeah, so moderate. what would be the frequency of, of birds? Moderate. Moderate. Moderate to low. Okay. Occasional to, occasional to, no, top moral, guys. We're looking okay. at probability. So probably fre frequency. So occasional. Occasional. Seldom. Occasional yeah. seldom. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's just stick in this area for, for a second, occasional seldom. And so if we were to, if we really had to make a choice, which one would we choose? If you're near a garbage dump, occasional. 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 If you're not okay. occasional. Okay. So, and then now under the severity, what, it, what would, do we have a minor injury, illness, loss or damage, somewhat degraded unit? Damage and somewhat degraded unit. Because again, exactly. If the bird attacks the the plant, the if, if a bird attacks the bird, if a bird attacks the SUAS, there's no injury. So we're talking damage. Well, if there's damage, then we can even maybe even go back to loss or damage. You can go to negligible because there is no injury, right? But there is an impact to unit readiness. So we, I would say that we would have to go to moderate. So if we look at occasional, moderate, then our, our risk assessment is moderate. Okay. What else could, so use it now, let's, let's keep going down that track. So if we, if we look at, um, oops, so that's our hazard. We've got our risk level. What's our risk control with birds? Not much you can do other than a scarecrow. A good spot, a good uh, visual observer. Yeah, I mean, you can keep your eye open for them, right? That's probably, like you said, that's the best you can do is keep your eyes open for birds and, poten and, and potential attacks by birds. And of course, attacking birds, because we don't want to be running into birds either. Okay, so how will, who's, gonna, who's going to, or how will that be implemented? Observer. The but how would it be implemented? It's part, you know, maybe we need to put that as always part of our briefing. Because you guys just gave me another another one that to put in. But maybe that, you know, in our briefing, one of the things we're and let's keep an eye out for birds, guys. And gals. And who's gonna implement it? Pilot commander. 
pilot and technician, right? Both everybody. So basically the entire team. Okay. So if we're in the, the sub activity of flight, what other hazard can we encounter in flight? Loss control of the aircraft. Very good. So we we've lost control. We've lost control of the aircraft. So let's let's call. Let which one which lo, which loss of control do we want to use? Lost link or, or fly away? Lost linkage. Lost link. All right. So our hazard is a lost link. So what's our initial risk level? Uh, let's go back. Up. Moderate. What's our frequency for a lost link? I'd say seldom. I would agree. I would agree. I, I have actually had one lost link in the entire time I've been flying. So we've got seldom. And what would be the result of a, of a lost link? If we uh, let's think about our drone, let's let's use the sky do as an example. If there's a lost link, what's the what's the drone going to do? Oh, come home. Yeah, maybe okay. not come home. Or it may not come home. It may just do. It may just hover as as the lieutenant Skursky found out. Right. So, is there going to be any injury yeah. in, a, in a lost link situation? No. no. Oh. No. So if there's no injury, we are talking minimal to minor injury minimal. with loss or debt. And again, what's going to happen? We know we now know that it's not going to drop out of the air. It's just gonna, it's going to float down when the when, after the, when the battery hits that that uh, level where it says, "Hey, I got to land. I I I can't stay up here all day. I've given you a heart attack for 30, for 23 minutes. That's all I'm going to do." So. Exactly. So we can probably go to negligible, which gives us a low risk category, right? All right. So what's our risk control on a lost link? So I guess just uh, attempting to reconnect. Negligible. Right. Okay. So what? How? So how do we do that? Our risk control is training. Right. We 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 train for that possibility uh, of occurrence. That's our risk control. There's the, because the only way we're going to be able to deal with it is to is to learn how to how to deal with it, and the only way to learn is to train. So our risk control would be training. So how would it be implemented? through, you know, training procedures. And who would implement that? Yeah, I see. The PIC, exactly. All right, good. And that's what you've got to do with every single one that you're looking at, okay? And this is why I say it's a, it's, it, it's a living document because as you encounter stuff, you're going to come up with more and more things to fill out on this form. Uh, a quick question. Yep. With this, so you're going to be doing this even before you take off. Really, what you're you, if you start it now and put your turn your mind to it now, it's right. just something that you that you want to take a look at. Every activity that we do has to have a risk assessment. Well, well, yeah, but what I'm saying is because every flight or every mission is going to be different, this the risk assessment has to be tailored for that particular mission. No, we're taking we're taking if we are if we and, and this is what I was saying when we look at the risk assessment, we are we as picks because ninety five percent of what's going to be on here are going to be picked uh, was going to be pick uh, and and technician. So if we are aware of all of those all of those things happening, we're good. We're always good to go, and we're all we're always prepared to move on any of these hazards and on any of these activities. So it's not that we have to prepare this all the time. We always have it 
so that and as as we encounter something new we put it in for the next time okay and that's what i was saying about making it a living document so as i said i print it until i put something else in this is the i'm always going to be using the same one so why do it what you know why, why kill the trees it's always going to be the same one until I need it. I, I, I update it. And when I update it, then I'll just put a new, uh, I put a new one in with the new date and everything else. Okay. And so with that, uh, with that assessment in mind, we then turn our eye to the ORM form. Make sense? So these are the specific yes. things that we could encounter. And then we, and then, we're, that's what makes it so easy to go down the ORM in five, 10 minutes and go, yep, 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 yep. And if you start with the ORM form as your subtask, so for example, check weather. Weather is, you know, weather is a sub, is a sub uh, check, you know, checking weather. What are your hazards? Precipitation is a hazard. What's going to be your assessment on what, what, what's, uh, your 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 hazard is is uh, there what's the risk level on that okay well hopefully it's low why we don't fly in wet weather <laughs> we are not ducks <laughs> so what so what's the risk assessment after we've implemented our our our, uh, uh, our, our modification still low perfect no <laughs> I have a question. Yep. Uh, if you use the, um, what is it, the flight forecast and take a picture of it, can you use that to show for that day what it was of all the information on it? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Right. Uh, as a matter of fact, don't, if you're using UAV forecast, it's going to give you the it's going to give you the hourly forecast anyways. And it and, and it right. and it, the nice thing is is that it's in real time. So if you check it today, um, and we all we all know again, we all know what the weather is like in Michigan. I can I can look at a twenty four hour weather forecast and it's going to say sunny all day today and tomorrow, and at midnight we're getting a thunderstorm. <laughs> it's it, it's Michigan, folks. <laughs> you know, yep. uh, so so. That's why you want, and it will actually update as that happens because it's getting its information from the weather stations. And so it's gonna, it's gonna forecast, but it's also gonna change. So, but yeah, again, when you, because you're gonna, you're, everything is time hacked, right? So when, when you did your, when you did the, the weather, when you entered that weather into, um, into the, the uh, Wimmers, that has a timestamp on it as to what time you 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 checked your weather, right? And then yes. and that's why it says what is it what was it what is it in for the next twenty four <laughs> hours? You put it in, and then in your debrief, what was the weather really like? Sunny and clear. It got overcast. Whatever the case may be. Okay. So we've completed all the subcategories and hazards we've encountered, we are we expect to encounter. So now we need to determine the overall risk level. And it's really easy. We take a look at column nine and whatever the highest risk level listed is what we put in here. In my case, it's a medium. I have, like I said, I have one risk that's medium everything else is low. But because I have one medium, that's my overall residual risk level. And then I make a hard copy of it, put it in my binder because my binder comes with me everywhere I go. So I've created an all purpose overall plan and a recommended course of action. I wanna maintain currency with SUAS training and regulations and ensure that briefings include potential hazards. Continue thinking of ways to decrease risk and enhance safety. So if you have this overarching form, where you're going to tailor it is in your briefing. You're not going to talk about foxholes and rabbit holes 
if you're you're on a beach, right? Although foxholes and rabbit holes are potential hazards out out in the woods, because you what happens if you put you know if you you encounter a foxhole, your foot goes in it, you're liable to sprain your ankle, right? So you've got a you've got a, a little bit of a risk. How often does it occur? Very rarely, but it's still a risk. That's the my that's my problem. I'm one of these guys that throws everything on the table and then lets people sort through it. So that's why I have this form that's four pages long. <laughs> not be not because I'm a pessimist. I, I I'm just all right. What else can go wrong? I you know I spent too many years in scouting where you plan for the worst, you hope for the best, and plan for the worst. <laughs> so. Since I've always got a hard copy with me, I can easily pull it out if anybody at Incident Command wants to approve it and fill out their portion because sometimes they do. They do need this. So I've already, I've always got that copy where they'll, they, you know, oh, oh, we're not going to approve this. Oh, you're not? Why? What did I miss? You know, my, uh, the way I've done it, I can't see why, why nobody at Incident Command would not approve it. And then they would sign and, and then they can keep that hard copy and I'll just print off a new one for myself and put it back in my binder. And that, and really that's what this is all about. It's, it's just, it's an exercise that if you're really bored and that was the other, the other problem is I did this during COVID. So I was really bored. You got nothing better to do. You're sitting at, you're sitting at, oh, there's another thing. And you start writing it down. And then you go to the, your computer and you type it up and you keep going and keep going. And, you know, all of us, I think a couple of times that poor Lieutenant Boar jumped out of her skin because I went, oh, another one. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay so that and that's so all of, all really all of this to say listen that what we want to do is you want to have a copy of this form on you and if you can think more in generalities of suas flight and then you just have to pick and choose the ones that are definitely going to be present uh on on the specific mission that you're flying does that make sense yeah yes all right. So, any questions on that? No. Oh, yes. I was only off by four minutes on that one. That's good. <laughs> okay. So, now let me do. Okay. 